Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the UBC um, Youth Circle. And um, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, for the Adobe Connect, those are, those are the um, people that are connected via the computer. If you could please, um, we, we aren't able to fully um, interact with you. So if you have a question in the classroom, if you can put up your hand and the person that's operating the computer will type in the question. And we have technical support here in the room, Catherine Berry, our <laughs> program assistant. And she will actually relay the question to us, um, to Elisa. And um, what was the other one? Okay, so um, we're ready to start today. My name is Crystal Morris. I'm the Aboriginal Education Coordinator for the School of Population and Public Health. Welcome to our circle, um, and I'd like to recognize the traditional territory that our office here at the UBC Learning Circle resides, which is the Musqueam uh, Nation Territory. So welcome, and at this point in time, I'm actually going to turn the floor over to Elisa um, Derek, who's going to introduce herself. Um, in addition to that, I want to apologize for um, running late just a little bit today. Um, and thank you for joining us, and I look forward to today's session. So, Elisa Derek, I'll let you take the floor. Hi, everyone. My name is Elisa Derek. I am a third year criminology student at SFU, double minor in First Nation Studies and Women's Studies. I currently work at the Vancouver Aboriginal Friendship Centre as a program coordinator for the Healthy and Holistic Aboriginal Families Program. In addition, I am also a research assistant uh, with Dr. Michelle Pigeon at Simon Fraser University, uh, researching why Aboriginal students stay and leave university. Would you like to me to elaborate more? Or can I just go you can yeah. into full detail? Yes, you can go right into your presentation. Okay, and talk perfect. About Okay, so I've been, um, I've been thinking about this quite a bit, actually, uh, with uh, former students who I know at UBC, um, as well as SFU and Langara, and how do I, how do I start, start this topic, and how do I you know, build it in, in, into education, and where we began was stories of how you get here. And so I thought I would start with my home community and kind of give a little bit of of condensed detail um, about my life and how I've come here and you know I've gone to university and I've gone to nationals and I'm running my own program now at 20, 21 tomorrow. Um, so it started in Smithers. I, I was born in Prince Rupert and I, uh, I grew up in Smithers and I lived there until I was in middle school and it's an interesting town. It's, it's unique. Um, for a lot of small communities, you can definitely relate. It began with elementary school, and then I, you know, I jumped into into middle school in Chandler before it shut down. And there was a lot of, and maybe I didn't recognize it. There was a lot of racism that was going on, and unfortunately, there was at, at one point in the academic year that I can recall being being choked up to a locker by another Aboriginal student. And, uh, you know, I touched in it about, I, I lost a bit of sense of direction where I was going in terms of culture and in terms of academics. I, uh, there wasn't much to do in Smithers except for in the summertime to play baseball and to do all those things. But during the, the school year in the winter, um, I started to get into pot and a lot of drugs and drinking and skipping classes. And it got bad to the point where I, I needed to leave. I needed to move towns. And uh, so I moved to Prince Rupert. I lived with uh, my Asian side. I transferred from my, uh, my First Nations to my Asian side. And I went there and thought, you know, to start over and to play badminton. Um, I went to school there. And uh, unfortunately, uh, during my time there, a, I was in grade 10 and uh, my father had committed suicide when I was 15 and it was it's a huge it's a huge transition because you need to you need to deal with the fact of living on your own now and being able to go to school and uh, in following that three months later unfortunately my grandfather my grandfather passed away uh, from a heart attack and then following that three months later uh, me and my ex-boyfriend of three years had separated there was just way too much going on it was 
too many transitions and I was really, really losing myself and uh, developing from that uh, was an eating disorder and you know my life was going through a huge transition and uh, the only way that I could deal with it at that time was to work and to run. So for any of, the, any of you who know of Prince Rupert and Port Ed and you know that that's a, about a 20 kilometer one way, I used to run uh, there and back on the weekends just to like de-stress, de so running 4K um, during the weekends, 40, sorry. And then in the summertime um, of my grade 11 year, I took another huge jump and I was working three jobs and for the entire summer and, you know, trying to support myself at 15, living on my own. And I had two days off and I was Googling a whole bunch of things and seeing where can I go for my two days off? Like, where could I fly, is there any cool like cultural events I could go to, and uh, there was a badminton camp uh, in Terrace, two, two hour drive, so I, I hopped on a train and I asked to be billeted with a badminton family there, and uh, that's where I met my future coach, who is my coach right now, and uh, I loved it, and I had so much passion for it, and he said, well, why don't you apply for the North American Indigenous Games, it's in two months, and he extended the offer if I love badminton so much, move to Vancouver. I'm thinking, who is this random white guy telling me to move to Vancouver <laughs> <laughs> and just leave my town? And uh, he gave me an opportunity to train. And so, anyways, I ended up going to the North American Indigenous Games. I got accepted. Um, I got a silver, bronze, and a gold there. And it was the most amazing experience ever. Um, it kind of made me realize how much I was missing out in terms of culture, in terms of academics and sports, and this is what I wanted. I wanted to go to school and to do and just to play badminton more than anything at that point in time. And then, when I moved here, I ended up staying with the uh, president of Badminton BC, and they were so kind enough to, to help me find uh, an athletics, I don't know really what they're called now, the names have changed, but... Uh, basically like a foster athletic uh, family. Um, their daughters that I was staying with were really naturally great soccer players and actresses. So I stayed there and uh, the transition from a small town to the city at 15, at 16, I guess, 16 was huge. Um, I was in culture shock in the worst way. I went to school with 1,500 students uh, jumping, you know, from 600 students, and I was one of four Aboriginal students in my school, and it was a huge shock, um, as well as badminton. Um, you know, there's a lot of jokes about it, but badminton is predominantly Asian <laughs> all across the board, um, and so when I was training on my team, uh, it was difficult. There was different values and different morals and I found that I was losing myself even though I was training and competing for nationals um, because none of them could relate. None of them could relate to abuse or sexual abuse or deaths or ceremony or just the, what's the most polite way to say this, just kind of the crap that goes on in, in you know, in just reality of it, um, you know, to live in a skip generation home with your grandmother raising you or one parent or one mom being in rehab or one family member being dead or alcoholic. Like, to them, that they learn about that in the textbook. Like, they could not fathom this. This is not a part of their reality. And so when I came here to play badminton, it was, it was a shock. I was pretending to be someone who I wasn't, and it took me quite a few years to kind of overcome that. Um, and so, anyways, as, as I started competing in nationals, it was, you know, my coach encouraged me to go get a GP, a family doctor, and get all these tests done, and my GP was, you know, wow, you have such high blood pressure, and at first I was thinking, oh man, this is, this is a problem, because, you know, uh, diabetes and high blood pressure, it's really, it's an alarming rate um, for Aboriginal people right now, and so we kept following up tests, and... Um, we ended up finding out that I had renal failure. And so renal failure is when both your kidneys are starting to disintegrate. They cannot function at the regular capacity. And so we said, okay, like what's the next step? What can I do? Um, it's, I can't dwell on it. This is the reality of the situation. 
Um, and they said, you know what, you'll, ha you'll have until you're 30, roughly 30, like you can live healthy, do school, be in nationals, work, and I was like, okay, good, I can finish my bachelor's, you know, I can go straight into my master's, worry about it later. Didn't quite pan out that way. Um, I was at Langara College, um, which I actually ended up going to Langara only because of badminton. Um, and halfway through my time there, or three quarters, sorry, uh, they, I received a phone call in December uh, of 2011 saying, you know, not we're just kidding, but you actually do need a transplant relatively soon. Your GFR level, which is your kidney function level, was going down faster than they could help me. And so I thought, okay, I'm not going to drop out of school. You know, my band has already supported me in being in school, so I'm going to finish my exams. I'm going to finish strong. And I ended up with like an A and some Bs. You know, not great, not bad. Um, and uh, I decided to play the Canadian Nationals. Uh, my last, you know, my last try, my last chance. Um, I didn't do as well as I had anticipated for my last year. Uh, but it was during that process that I had a group of students, um, some Aboriginal students, which blew my mind away and which has really started to reconnect me to my Aboriginal community who got tested to be my donors. Absolutely amazing. There's a small group of them from Langara College and the support worker there, Larry Realton, it has done an amazing job with, with their faculty and with the supports there. And uh, they got tested for me and I went home. I went home for a couple of reasons. One, I hadn't been home in a while, and I went back to Smithers and Prince Rupert, and I, you know, I got to hang out with my family, and I was progressively getting sicker, and I got a phone call one day, and uh, one of the students at Langara was a match, and it was amazing. I, I can't even describe that, what it feels like. Maybe for some of you guys who play in the All-Native, and like maybe winning that first place, that is like the equivalent, and maybe a bit beyond that. Um, and then uh, that summer, I had a bit, uh, my parent, like, we were thinking, oh my god, I'm pretty, like, pretty close to die, right? My kidney, but my, both my kidneys were working at 6%, and I ended up with a blood infection in Smithers, um, and I had to be in the hospital in Prince Rupert, and uh, I, they didn't know what to do with me, because they have no nephrologists, which are kidney specialist doctors, um, up there to support me, and they were like, okay, so I, you know, I came back to, I came back to Vancouver, and then, uh, I ended up getting food poisoning and my kidney function took another hit. And you know, my doctors made this joke because I'm so accident prone. Like, Elisa, please just stay home. Like, we don't, we, <laughs> we need to be able, you need to be alive for us to do this transplant. And uh, so I came, I came back to Vancouver and uh, I got, a, I spent every day with my donor. And we, you know, we had this inside joke uh, for two people who are doing nothing and for the first time in my life since 17. Every semester, including summers, I've been in school. So for me, it was a huge shock in terms of what can I do? What can I? I'm missing something. I, you know, I have academics, I have sports. I'm looking after my health. I felt like I was missing something. And uh, my donor, uh, Adrian Charlie, amazing woman, uh, for obvious reasons and many more. Uh, she took me to my first powwow, and it was mind blowing. Like it was so amazing, so it was like so heartfelt and. Uh, I got to go to so many events and see different people and see a tribe called Red. You guys should Google them. They're amazing. Um, and I got to, you know, make my first drum. And I got to do a lot of cool things that I really wanted to do. So, where am I now? Stemming from that, uh, you know, I had my transplant. And it is, I lost myself for a good year. It's been a year and a half since my transplant. Um, I'm just kind of going through the motion. And, not even being able to comprehend that I've, I've had an organ transplant. You know, like my doctors physically cut through my muscle tissue, my stomach, and put in my best friend's kidney. Like it took me a while to really realize that. And uh, the, I remember feeling such gratitude after, after my transplant uh, because things we take for granted, being able to shower by yourself, being able to walk, now that's a huge thing and for someone who's used to running and playing badminton. Um, I couldn't, you know, they made me walk around like 12 hours after my transplant and it is the most painful thing and you appreciate things in such a huge capacity, I, I can't even put words into it. And so, you know, after my transplant, I, I was really pushing. I've, I've turned into, I feel like 
an overachiever and I've been in the last couple of years trying to figure out why that is. And I jumped into Langara going in it for the, all the wrong reasons and leading up to that is I can give advice is for Aboriginal students and non-Aboriginal students is if you're going to go to school, you go for it for yourself. Do things that you want to do because that's what you want to do and that don't attribute it to that you're doing this because you want to prove that the statistics are wrong or that you want to prove that you're not like, you know, what the stereotype Aboriginal person is and drinking and drugs, that it's not, it's not that. And so I went into school and I went into competing for nationals and working three jobs and doing all these crazy things because I really wanted to prove that that wasn't right, that that's not the label, that's not Aboriginal people at, at all. Um, it's just that we're in a healing period, we're in a generational healing period and uh, to do things for your own, your own benefit, your own virtue. And so now being at SFU, it's only been in the last few months that I've learned that working two jobs, taking four courses, working out and squeezing in some time to sit on eight board committees is psycho. It's not feasible. I do not recommend it. I encourage to be to be involved in the community because it makes you feel amazing and good. But you also, I feel like this is, um, you know, this is my opinion, not my opinion of Aboriginal people in general. Um, and just my personality is learning how to take time for yourself and not feeling, you know, guilty that you have to do X, Y, and Z for your community, for your grandmother, for, but you also, you need to take care of yourself before you can take care of your community, before you can take care of your family. And once you do that, you will realize how quickly and how fast that changes will happen in your family, in your personal life, in your communities. And it's difficult, it's hard to take that. For me, it's hard to take that, okay, I need to go to the gym four times a week, even if it's for half an hour, because that's, that's my own mental wellness. And if you want to put this in a scope of a medicine wheel, you know, you need to take care of that component just as equally as important as those other three components. So now being at SFU, I'm 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 learning. I'm learning. I'm always in a learning in a learning process, and it's always have to be having to be in a you know a positive mindset and uh, relaying it back to education. Um, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, it really has. I uh, you know unfortunately I had my and I you know I everything that I say I don't mean to say it in a negative light or any mean. It's just the facts. It's just the reality of it and I'm being, you know, not dwelling on it. Um, unfortunately, my band funding actually cut me four days after my kidney transplant and I was mind blown. I was like, how is this possible? I jumped in to do my degree at 17 and I don't understand, like I couldn't comprehend it. I was like, okay, what am I gonna do? And uh, fortunately enough, I applied for scholarships and bursaries the year before. <laughs> And so all of a sudden come September, with along with working jobs, I was able to put myself through school. And uh, the costs are huge. And I would say that for the biggest barrier for me for being in school, it's not the money. It really isn't, because it's out there for you. There's so many scholarships. I could name 10 off the top of my head, ranging from 1000 to $5,000 that you can apply for. Um, it's, it's being a sense of belonging and community here and making the connection with friends and making that connection with your professors and just balance, because it is a huge shift. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but now I'm, I'm losing myself as to where I was going with this. I was trickling to school and... You're talking about the culture and tying in mm -hmm. the culture and belonging to community. That's the piece you were missing and you were finding. I'm missing. Yeah. I'm finding those right, things. okay, so I'm trying to connect this, sorry. I just had five hours of stats at five in the morning, so I'm just, I have just got here, so I'm recovering. Um, for that is, you know, going back to school and, you know, of course, I want to encourage all Aboriginal youth to go to school and be educated, but keeping in mind education could mean your culture. It can mean, it can mean revitalizing your language. Education can mean making, you know, being an artist. Um, but for me, education, I'm choosing to be in the post-secondary and, you know, to do a degree, but that it, it was difficult for me because there's no sense of culture and commitment. So on top of my transplant and on top of, you know, losing a lot of friends because you will, after high school, you will, you know, you will trickle out of friends and it, it's a difficult, it's a difficult phase. 
And on top of that, add, um, add a dying friend into that mix and you'll lose <laughs> a little more friends. But it's, it's amazing that you will realize eventually, um, you know, as you get older, that it could take a handful of friends and you could be the happiest person. Um, and I, I have a, a solid group of 10 friends and I have many acquaintances, many, many, many acquaintances, <laughs> but it's the, it's the close friends that are, that are amazing. And, uh, fortunately enough, they are actually all Aboriginal students. I have some, some, you know, amazing best friends that are not, um, Aboriginal, but in finding my connection to my community and to culture, um, it's definitely been amazing to have them. And so when we talk about... Um, you know, we often talk about being in the education system and what's missing and what's being misguided and going to forums to try and change it and a lot of it is definitely the resources and supports that are in, um, in university for when you guys want to come uh, and that's all about what my research is right now, which is amazing. Um, it's being a part of that and so I've, I've lost my way a little bit after my transplant and um, it was mainly about, I was scared to die. I finally, a year after my transplant, I was I was scared to die. And so this last year, and now it's been a year and a half, so I wanted to do everything. I wanted to experience everything. I wanted to do everything. I, like, I looked at my list and I was like, okay, you know, I've gone to nationals four times. Boom, that's out of the door. I've, you know, I've got my diploma, okay, that's done. I, I can finish my degree and squeeze it in and go straight into my master's of public and social policy. Like, I want to feel and experience everything, and that's why I jumped on all these cultural coordinator positions, program coordinator positions, and because I was like, you know what, if I, like, theoretically, if I die, I've lived an amazing life because I've got to experience being a part of different communities, and by communities, I mean not only Aboriginal, but just communities in general in Vancouver, and it was been amazing but now I've realized a year and a half later I've, I've got some time like I don't need to <laughs> I don't need to do a million and one things and to be happy and to do things that are for me and as much as I love helping people which I'm sure Crystal in the short time that we've met um, can attest to that uh, is that I have time and I can always go back to, you know, go back and uh, do things that I want to do in the future and really, really work towards that. Um, and so there's some key things that I really want to pull out here and, um, and that's being able to say and to recognize, okay, this is what has happened in my family, whether it's been loss or death, um, because all of these components are, are a part of grief. And you can grieve about anything. You can grieve about about failing. You can grieve about a loss in a basketball game. You can grieve about you know a death in the family. And these all cycle in a stage. And you need to be able to identify this and be able to go through all of the cycles of healing. And to take time, it takes time. I can't say that when I moved here, I didn't expect my grandmother to get cancer and me to be able to be in grade 12, train 30 hours a week, and then take my grandma to chemotherapy. Like, it's difficult. And so all of this has taken years. Um, and years, I mean, this has all been condensed in four years. But it's, you know, it, it's taking, it takes time. And it, it takes time for different people. But to always remember that, to keep an end goal. there, And to keep that in mind, if it's written journaling, if it's, you know, smudging and doing a prayer every night, whether it's running and you need to do these things, but to always keep it in perspective that it's um, you, it's a process. It's a process of healing. It's a process of getting to your goals. And for some, it'll take 20, 30 years, five months, a year. It's all dependent on, on your positive thoughts and what you want to do. And I'm not going to say that there wasn't low moments because I'm, I'm super appreciative of life right now, but I, I totally can recognize that. I just, I feel like everyone has this, this common sense um, and it's universal and that's everyone wants to be loved. And to not feel that in your community, not to feel that it's within yourself and um, within your family, I understand it. I, I genuinely do. And um, I'm at the process of learning that you know, how can I love people around me and help 
the communities and uh, and do things without loving myself. And uh, you know, I, I sit on a lot of <laughs> a lot of committees here in Vancouver, and I can give an example of NAG. I'm good, I'm a part of the Aboriginal Provincial Committee um, for the upcoming North American Indigenous Games. And I'm looking at all the athletes, and I'm thinking. I can really identify and really see which athletes are, they're there because they feel loved, they're there because of this is their passion, and, and they're there because they want, they want that, and, and everyone wants that, and it's a, it's a matter of being able to recognize that, and, uh, you know, and in the past, um, sorry to jump back and forth, um, sure, uh, but in the past, you know, I had an eating disorder develop, and I, I didn't know what that was. It wasn't talked about in my town. It wasn't talked about in school. It's not something most girls recognize in a small town. So when I moved to the city, it was really, it was really relevant. Uh, uh, and uh, for girls, it's like a, for me, it was a control. I couldn't control anything in my life. And the only healthy outlets that I had when I was younger was an eating disorder and was, you know, smoking pot and skipping class because these are things that I had control over. But over time, I realized there's a lot you have control over. You have control to go to class every day. You have control to ask for help. You have control to join a sports team if that's not ready available for you because of financing. And you can always go to your local friendship center and ask what is there, how can I apply for money to, to do sports, or how can I, how can I do something, you know, there's, there's always, there is always that possibility, and for me, it took a lot of, look, a little guidance and support, but recognizing that badminton had to be my outlet, exercise had to be my outlet, um, and, but also to find things that are non-physical, that can keep you motivated, and, and sound as a as a whole person, and I really discovered that after my transplant, not being able to work out 30 hours a week and go to school, I had a difficult transition, and that's what led me to three jobs and eight board committees. And now it's time to reevaluate and refigure out. Okay, let's drop it down to one job, four courses, and maybe three board committees instead of <laughs> the million and the million and one that I that I do. Um, do you sleep? Do I sleep? Oh God. You know what? Someone said I wasn't human the other day. I had another Aboriginal student who I mentor. I'm also a mentor. Um, <laughs> at SFU and uh, you know they're like, are you human? Like is this Hang on, hang on. Why did they do sparkle? Yeah, I get all oh, Twilight. Oh, yeah. I was just like, I so, so I'm just <laughs> I don't know. No, it's, it's it's potential. It's it's possibility. But um, so I don't know. I think that's. I feel like that's my life. And obviously, that's a really condensed, short version. And the, you know, issues dig a lot deeper like that into my life, um, as do they do in your own personal lives, or your community, or your family. Um, and right, right now, it's being able to, I'm in a position right now of like separating what's going on with my family and how do I do that, as well as be my own person and my own physical well-being, because this incorporates both not into Aboriginal communities, but as well as non-Aboriginal communities, uh, to be able to do things for you and you realizing that by going to class and going to school or choosing to do alternative methods that aren't self-destructive, -destruct um, you have to do that because you want to do that and you have to do that before you can help your family and it's a difficult thing because there's so much help and need in Aboriginal communities right now and it's to really focus on the fact that as a community we can't get better if we individually don't work together and we don't focus on on the issues and the problems around um, post the post effects of residential school or the socioeconomic of Aboriginal people right now and it's it'll take time and and you know for some people there's a lot of anger in that and it you I'm just trying to thank you like you need to remove that anger you need to remove anger from everything that you do before you can really genuinely do things. And so uh, that, that also takes time.
So, is there any any questions? Is there, is there any questions or comments? Is there any questions or comments here in the room? We do have a couple of youth here in the room with us today. Um, any comments from any of the classrooms that are joining us, or any comments that you would like to make? If you would just get your instructor. Um, to type it into the computer and we can relay a comment to Elisa. Okay. It takes a minute to type things in. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. You know, I was, I'm just going to give you my, my typical day that I took questions come swimming in. Uh, this morning, you know, I got up at 6 in the morning uh, to meet my stats tutor and I was like dreading it. like. Stats is the one thing I will recognize. I'm not very good at math. I can be good at many things, but I have to accept this. It's taking me a lot more time than I would like. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm driving to school and then, you know, coming here to do this. And then right after this, I'm going to be going, making shepherd's pie at the Friendship Center for a program that I run from five to eight. And then do my online class after that and get an agenda. Everyone, <laughs> you need it. You really do. So, yes. Um, I I guess you brought up a couple of talk topics definitely that I know we've discussed in mm -hmm. our discussions. Yeah. And um, definitely with the eating disorders mm -hmm. and recognizing that. Like, did you have professional help with that, or just the? You know what? It was. It was interesting. Um, when it developed, uh, my coach had noticed it, and he was, you know, we did, we had discussed openly, like, why are you training 30, 40 hours a week, and you're not losing weight, but you're gaining weight, like, this makes no sense at all, and uh, so he, he told me to go to a doctor, and so we had to, you know, we did, and unfortunately in BC, for those of you who live in the lower mainland, and and young women that deal with eating disorders were lucky because St. Paul's is the is the provincial organization for eating disorders, but that doesn't help if you're in small communities and there's nothing there. And so I've tried I tried probably five different programs since I've been here in Vancouver, but it was hard because they were treating me as if I was living with my parents, developing a food plan as if this is what I really eat. And uh, it was interesting. I had to really take components of it. I had to take a little bit of what some people might call Western components and really indigenize them or make them my own, if, if not cultural. And it, it took me a bit of practice and it's taking me a bit of time to do this um, because it's a process. It's, um, it's a control tactic, it, as most eating disorders are. And uh, you know, athletes unfortunately develop them at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. On top of being a female athlete, it made it really surreal for me because I, again, I was on a team with a lot of petite Asian girls, and it was like, <laughs> I was, you know, it was just stressful. And so, you know, we tried five, six, seven different programs here um, during my first two years of Langara, and they just weren't working for me. And so finally I, I decided from that time to take components of that, to really work with it and to really focus on taking that time for me. And so medically, unfortunately it didn't work out, but being involved in that and recognizing, I know what resources are there and to understand what resources are out there for you, whether it's an eating disorder, whether it's a drinking and alcohol problem, whether it's substance abuse in general, um, is to really, is to take that step and to, to move into finding out what's there and it won't work for you. Not all of them will work for you, but for the ones that do work for you, it will it will take time. To, you have to mold it to make it your own in order for it, for it to work. And so now that's the part that I'm at is I, I, make, it, I make it work. I've made it work to um, incorporate. I would never go buy what they're recommending steak and cooking it all and freezer packing it. Like I'm thinking that is definitely not, you know, I would open a jar of salmon, like that's like, <laughs> I don't, I don't. I would never go and buy, you know, steak. Um, but anyway, so to answer your question, I I did, I, I used medical support and, you know, I went through that system, but it was also difficult because I didn't, I didn't outsource enough. I didn't realize that there was an Aboriginal patient navigator during my transplant. Um, and during my process of the eating disorder, 
and uh, I've actually only learned about it um, because one of my clients at the Friendship Center, unfortunately, is going through cancer. So that's how I found out that it was there, because it was my job to find out it was there. But to treat problems like that, like an eating disorder or anything, because it is your job. It's your job. It's your, you know, it's your personal health. It's your responsibility, and you have to treat it as such because it's so important. And uh, so that is how I managed and found out about what's there, and it's been an interesting journey for sure. So do you think a piece of all of this was um, recognizing that inside you talked about um, needing and knowing and feeling that you needed more, the more of the cultural connections? Do you, was, do you think that there, there, there was, was some a, there direct was a correlation there? There was. There was a huge tie um, because it's lessened, a lesson to it's not present in my life. Um, and it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing because it was definitely the ability to connect with my grandmother and reconnect to language and culture and there was just a huge component I felt that was missing because I'm living in so many different worlds. I'm living in a world where half of my family is Vietnamese. So I have all of the traditional Asian beliefs where at 15, I was before my dad passed away, I was kicked out of my house for secretly going away to a badminton tournament because women are expected to go to school, become educated, but then it's ironic because in my family, they kind of expect you to be a stay-at-home mom. So, and then there's my other side where, you know, it's my Aboriginal side and I, I'm the reality of it. I will be the first one to graduate high school. I'll be the first one to graduate with my degree and my diploma and to, to mesh these worlds together and during this huge crazy time was the transition of family um, and I call them my adoptive family and uh, they are white and uh, they you know they've seen me grow up as a girl and they've really helped me mold and transition into the woman I'm becoming um, but without them how do you work in these three different worlds and now I'm, I'm jumping into four different worlds once you're in school is how do you how do youth um, who are so lost in Aboriginal communities or just in general and dealing with a lot of a lot of crap that goes on at home uh, when you're dealing with two worlds you you know your Aboriginal side of your family and then you know being in school because it is really hard to relate with other students when you want to talk about certain things and that's where I'm being able to recognize it now it's difficult to talk about hey I just went to a tribe called Red or hey I just went to like this awesome powwow or I went to this awesome conference or you know, me and my grandmother did this, or it, they really, I find it really difficult, and that's okay, there's, you know, um, people, I like to look at it as people, it's not that people are ignorant, they just don't know, they really don't, and so I always like to keep that in mind when I talk to, to people, and, and to, to lead up to an example of that, I, um, unfortunately, I had a really bad experience uh, last Friday, uh, <laughs> And some, you know, uh, so I was studying at a cafe until about two in the morning at a, tw at a 24 hour uh, cafe uh, downtown uh, Vancouver, right across from SFU uh, campus. And I thought, okay, I'm not gonna bus home right now. Clubs are closing. Like I was trying to be really smart about this. And so I called a cab and a cab showed up. And, you know, as a student, and I'm sure as many of you might know, when you wanna come to school sometimes, you don't look the best. I you know, your typical like massive all native hoodie that had like the dates the back and like my basketball sweatpants and I was not looking that great. I can I can <laughs> guarantee that. And uh, so I jumped in this cab and, and two cab stops, two red lights, sorry, later the cab driver demanded to see cash. So I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, okay, I don't have cash and I'm explaining to this to him and that I have my MasterCard and I have my status card. So that's all I had on me. Cause when I'm downtown, there's no way I'm gonna carry cash on me that late at night. I'm not gonna bring my whole wallet. And I had my Mac and my, my brand new iPhone. Cause unfortunately right. I lost your iPhone. That's unfortunately right. my iPhone, there was a little miss, uh, there's a little mis event to losing my phone. Um, but, and I can speak to that in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
And so I'm talking with him, and I'm like, you know what? I can give you my status card. I will give you my status card, and I will go and leave in my leave my backpack here. I will leave all of my textbooks, which are hundreds of dollars, like you know. But I'll I'll take my Mac and my iPhone and put it in my house. And we just started start to get into this huge disagreement, and and he was just like, I will not take your status card. It's not real ID. And usually I'm very I'm very sound about figuring out situations, I'm very logical, and at this point I was angry. I was mad and I was livid and I was like, there's no way, and he was wanting my Mac, my iPhone, to keep it for as a... Security. For security payment. for payment. And I, I was thinking, there's no way. There's absolutely no way I'm going to hand over two grand and go to my house and get cash. Um, Anyways, he unfortunately asked me to leave his cab after a few disagreements at 2.30 in the morning at Main and Hastings. Um, and for those of you who don't know what Main and, ha Main and Hastings is in Vancouver, <laughs> it is the poorest and most dangerous postal code area, and I mean that in terms of just condensed crime rate. And um, Anyways, he left me in that area, and I just like sat and hung out at Main and Hastings, and I was like, literally almost in tears, not because I was scared to be at Main and Hastings, because those are the clients that I work with, I'm surrounded by Aboriginal people at Main and Hastings, and I'm thinking, well, nothing can go wrong, and that's a really naive thing of me to say, um, I was upset, because I was like, I wanted an apology from him, I demanded an apology, <laughs> because that was, you know, I wasn't mad, I didn't want, you know, and so I ended up calling the company, and ended up calling me back, and they wanted me to sign a non-disclosure form. And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, this is definitely not about money. And so I, I started thinking about this, about treaties and about land claims and about Aboriginal people. And maybe I've taken one too many philosophy classes, but, <laughs> but I really started to, to dwell into this issue. And I was like, no, there's no way I'm going to accept X amount of dollars for a non-disclosure and not to speak about this. And it's not because I'm a crim student. And <laughs> it's because it was the principle of it. And this is kind of the, the key component I want people to take from the stories, the principle behind the actions that we do. Because as Aboriginal people, when you do things, you're not only representing yourself and your own integrity, but unfortunately, society will claim you as an entire, you're representing an entire Aboriginal group. And that's just the reality of it. And it takes some time to really recognize that. Um, and I called the company, I was like, this is not what I want. I was like, I want an apology because what he did was wrong. It was, you know, and I was, so I went on Facebook that night and I, you know, I did a little bend. There was no swear words, there was no slurs. It was very, you know, but that also made me think. It made me think about, A, I have to watch what I put on Facebook. It's, it's there forever, and you know, I think about all the times in high school, during all night of tournaments, or just graduation, how many crazy photos go on Facebook, and how dangerous that is, straight dangerous that is to A, like your integrity and like your future, you have no idea. Um, and I can build into that a bit later, but I ended up calling back the company, and so tomorrow I'm gonna go meet with this, this fellow and the director of the company to receive a written apology letter. And you're bringing two big natives with you, right? I, no, I'm gonna go in by myself. I'm like, I'm a strong woman, I can do this by myself. Yay, and I was like, so. <laughs> I was like, and I called the company, I was like, it's not about the money, and I can prove this to you because I want him to apologize. And it's not even just the apology, it was, it's more of I will sit down and have tea and coffee with this guy and talk to him a little bit about I recognize, I totally recognize what he must feel because he wouldn't treat me like this unless he's had previous experience. But I want to leave him with a positive experience. I want to leave him with an experience that not all Aboriginal people are like this and to explain the healing process because a lot of immigrants and new people coming to Canada, even people who've lived here for generations, don't understand. And I can give an example, my family who came here from Vietnam have no idea. When I had my transplant, they were like, no, it has to be your native side. My Asian side. Or no, my native side. No, it has to be the Asians. Like, just an interesting concept of just not being aware and knowledgeable about an issue. So now, elaborating onto a second uh, story is my cell phone with Crystal. Now, I run a program 
by myself with the support of two workers at the Friendship Center here in Vancouver. And I, <laughs> I'm laughing at this story because it's really, I, I've taken it in the most positive light. And it, you know, I work really closely with five families and they each are amazing and uh, each of them are struggling with either selling drugs at Maine and Hastings or prostitution or cancer, like living out of their van. Living out of their van, divorce. So I deal with some pretty heavy caseloads that I'm trying to support. And one evening, you know, I've gotten to know them over the last six months, and so I, you know, I'm pretty close with them. And uh, one evening, after we made uh, some candy apples, and uh, everyone had left, and there was no new families, no new kids in the program, my phone was gone. And I'm thinking, it probably died. My alarm to take my anti-rejection medicine, it probably died. I'm thinking, oh, man, Lisa, you're really losing it. That totally was not the case. Definitely someone stole it from my program. And it was so funny because my, my coworkers were like so mad for me. And I was thinking, all right, this isn't, you know, for me, I, I'm thinking about a deeper issue. And it's about, A, they just wanted to take the phone just to take it and to sell it or to use it. Or B, which is after working with a lot of the youth and really recognizing it's, there's a need there. There is an in-depth and rooted need that is going on there. And what is it? Is it that uh, there's not enough support happening at home, or that you know the program is ending? And I'm seeing families go into chaos as this program is about to end because this is the rawness of this community that's being built. And I know a couple of boys who have shown up every Thursday night from 5 to 10 p.m. to or 9, sorry, 9 p.m. to be in this program and to cook and to learn about nutrition and so I wasn't angry I really wasn't at first I was like this is a really expensive $600 mistake on both parties um, and it was to not be mad <laughs> the lesson was really you can't yes anger is a part of a cycle that you need to deal with when issues arise um, but you can't be mad about it because shit happens that's just the reality of it, and to, <laughs> and to learn and, and, and to learn from it, and and to really recognize that I needed to work with this group in a different capacity. I needed to to figure out, you know, what needs need to be met, and so I started, you know, looking around, and we found different grant money to keep the program running. So now I'm seeing this other shift in families where now they're becoming even more involved and even more engaged because they're thinking, this is amazing. And I honestly would recommend a program like this in every Aboriginal community to like, because having said that little boy that comes and he's seven years old and he walks home every night with his older brother who's nine years old by themselves. And it's like, it's weird because it's so natural. Like they're, they've been doing it since, God, for them it's been time memorial. But for me, I was freaking out because I'm like, I'm gonna drive these boys home, but they didn't trust me to drive them home. <laughs> and I couldn't believe this. I was like, you know, gonna offer them a ride home, making sure they got home, but um, is that they have a community in that area, you know, where they they know someone at every block, and it's an, it's weird for me, because for me, I'm very like, I'm very mother-like. <laughs> I have to take them home. But anyways, the takeaway from that story is it is the process of, of being mad and to really recognize that you need to effectively, you know, effectively deal with things and then that to be mad over $600. I look at it this way, in your grand scheme of life, in point A, you're born to the point B that you die, like, what is $600? For me, I value time with my grandmother way more than I do $600. I value my time with these families, which unfortunately my phone was stolen than actually the physical component of $600. Um, and so, it's, <laughs> I'm still laughing about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah, stuff, stuff happens, but uh, I don't know, where else can we, can we elaborate that you'd like to um, jump into? I, I think, um, speaking from personal experience, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many of the students and how I don't even, my, my daughter's sitting here and my, my niece. And um, talking about asking for help, 
I know I actually had a hard time. I was actually a mature student returning to university before I actually learned to ask for help. It was actually a non-native co-student of mine that said I need to ask for help because English was an area in um, college that I struggled with. So speaking from personal experience, and I know we've had some conversations about mm -hmm. some of the resource books and you know moving to Vancouver, but even a message you know to the students about asking for help and feeling comfortable asking yeah. for help. And I mean, if you can't ask your parents, you know there's Aboriginal support mm -hmm. workers and there's First yeah. Nations and your 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 teacher. Sometimes you know that's a barrier for um, individuals, mm -hmm. right? Even. It could be a teacher that you're not, you don't get along the best with, but why is that? You know, maybe it's more help is needed in that area. If you could expand and talk a little bit about asking for help and feeling comfortable, because I know I wasn't, and I would have probably benefited long before my college years if somebody had said it's okay to ask for help yeah. and put your hand out. I think it's an interesting time because when I was in when I was in middle school in Chandler, I. Um, I could see professors being like, man, this girl is lost. I was dealing with issues of sexual abuse at the time. And I, and teacher, I opened up to one teacher at that point. And uh, I ended up becoming, becoming very close and not really recognizing that I needed help. And for me, um, especially after my dad died, and you know, I was already living on my own when I was 15, and I, I'm doing the whole living thing that you guys, that everyone that's young like wants to do. You guys want to, even I myself, I was like, oh yeah, I want to hurry up, I want to live on my own, and like, you know, it's <laughs> like, it's, it's a little more difficult than, than that. It's expensive, it's like, <laughs> you need to figure out a lot of things. Um, and it's hard, for me it was always hard, and to this day it's really, it's really hard. It's, it's, human nature for me and maybe for some other people is like the resistance the resistancy to ask for help because it you know I, I can give it a personal experience in my family like uh, residential school for some components of my family it's difficult for them to ask for help because asking for help means dealing with non-aboriginal sectors whether that means the health care the education um, sports and it can be really difficult. But there's also something more beautiful about that when you do ask for help, that Aboriginal or not Aboriginal, and that's the fact that that's your opportunity and that's your chance and your time to, to break down those stereotypes and to really work one-on-one -on -one with, whether it be your teachers or your coach, your own family, and saying, I need help. And it can be in different capacities. and. The benefits are huge, and there's no one that can do it better and ask for help because no one's gonna know what's going on with you. No one's gonna know that, you know, that abuse is happening in your home if you don't ask for help. And there is some hesitancy because of, you know, MCFD and being in foster homes and foster care. Um, but having said all of that, is that I look at it as that's my chance. This is my opportunity to help the helpers build better resources. So if you're, let's do a theoretical example here. Um, you know, being young, Aboriginal student, uh, smoking pot and being, using excessive drinking to solve, to solve a lot of stuff. Um, and you go in and you go into a detox program or you go into an out-based community program and it's not working for you, that's your chance to really work with them because there are resources, there are grants, there are people out there who care, people out there that they want to make a system that works. We don't, you know, systems aren't, aren't in place and programs aren't in place to, to watch you fail, to watch, to watch this really not work for another community. They're there to, because they need help. They're, they're basing this as off of non-Aboriginal programming, if it's culture components that you need into a program, tell them that. If there's ways to work around that, that like that's the beauty of it, is you can really mask a lot of programs to your needs. And it's about using your voice, and it's about using your voice in an effective, positive manner. And I know that can be hard, because in the moment, you're so angry, and there's a lot going on, and you're bitter, and you're mad, but to really engage in 
a more positive light rather than saying this is going wrong this is going wrong and now this program is not working but when you ask for help to recognize it won't be a quick fix it's a journey like everything else it's a journey just like from kindergarten to grade 12 there are some really great moments and there's some really crappy moments when you do your homework the night before but <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so I guess um when you talk about okay you touched on MCFD so were you in the system like a I mean funny story but before funny. you were 15 like I mean you're, you're pretty young like to yeah. me you're still pretty young I, I know all my, all my all my friends at UBC are like 27 I'm like oh here's a baby and I left them um you know what it wasn't I wasn't I I guess I was I don't know so let me think about this so my grandmother um, took care of us um, and by us I mean my brothers and sisters by herself when we were younger and how many five and my grandmother was 60 and she was taking care of babies at the time and uh, it was hard it was hard on my grandmother it was really frustrating for me because I felt like I couldn't connect with my grandma I could connect with her when it was summer times so we were doing stuff that was cultural but like I felt like she just didn't get it but it was also being young and angry and ignorance and changing but <laughs> Um, yeah, we, you know, my family was on welfare and there stems another issue is none of my friends were on welfare. None of them have had experience. Like I was super embarrassed um, to, to talk about that, to tell my friends. And there was only one friend growing up that knew because also working at 12 as well as, well, <laughs> I know, um, as well as having my other other side of my family they could never um, they could never tell because when, when I came to school I was in you know the cool clothes that were in or like I got a scooter when they were in I had Pokemon cards like you know I was a part of like <laughs> those, those huge those huge phases that happen in school but is to not be embarrassed about it and for me it was huge it was so stigmatizing and I, I I've internalized that and I internalize racism and I was my worst enemy for that and I I really it's yeah I'm really recognizing this in the last few years and so when my father passed away and I was already living on my own um, they tried they tried to put me in a foster home I think that's what it is I, I think that's what it was it was the idea the concept um, I ended up belonging to a foster home for less than 31 days um, their culture was not like mine. Um, they were a group of Jehovah Witnesses, and I was struggling with the idea of being Catholic, being Buddhist because of my parents, and being a normal religion. Like I was like, I cannot add Jehovah Witness into this Buddhist, Aboriginal, Catholic trying to figure out religion. And I decided, no, that's it. I went to my social worker and I like walked in. I had a letter ready, written, and I even like. You know, spell checked it, had someone else read it, and I was like, <laughs> politely, I demanded to live on my own. And I gave the list of reasons why. I told them, this is why I can do it. These are the resources. Here is my support. This is how I'm going to do it. So I've been kind of in care. And so having done that, I realized there's a lot of, there's a lot of screw-ups in the system. There's a lot of things that need to be changed. And so I'm on a provincial committee <laughs> for uh, the Federation Youth and Care Network. <laughs> <laughs> having a federation for youth and, and care. care network their support network for kids and for families that are Aboriginal and for anyone who's in care that wants to start up um, a group an organization in their local community can go to these people and uh, call or fax in Vancouver and they can apply grant money for them to start their own programs so now stemming from that, I'm also working with a lady in um, co-founding and to build uh, a nonprofit organization called the File Folder Project. And for those of you who don't know what it is, you can feel free to look it up on Facebook. Uh, there's a website. It's just simply thefilefolderproject.com, as is. And it was basically because an MP um, had written that we pay for Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals, but emphasis um, just on paying for them to be in care, and then we pay for them to be on the streets because that's what's going to happen. And so the, the idea and the concept behind this, and we're going to launch it in January, 
is to talk about success stories. So youth from all over the states and from Canada. Um, and there's been a couple of Aboriginal stories which have been beautiful for me because I'm the Aboriginal coordinator for the position or for the organization. And it's so wonderful to hear success stories, and it makes you feel like you're not the only one, and it makes you feel so good. And you know, to really recognize you could identify with a lot of the struggles that that person has been through, and that you get it and you understand it. Um, is talking about is challenging that idea, challenging those stigmas that. You can be Aboriginal, you can be not Aboriginal, you can go through the foster care system and have your family live on welfare and you know, have all these negative stereotypes, but still there's a positive life and positive story towards the end of that. And to be able to recognize that for yourself though. You know, I, I could sit here and I could speak I could speak for hours trying to encourage you to like not do drugs and to not drink and stay in school and be cool, but like it's <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work like that. Like you yourself need to want to do that. You yourself need to want to to be able to like go on trips and do these things and go travel and do all these amazing things. Like everything will fall into place, but you have to do it for yourself. And I can't, you know, I can like up talk and be so like positive and like sugarcoat it, but that I'm not gonna sugarcoat. There's it's not, you know, everything <laughs> We have a question? Yeah, we have a question yeah, from um, from Tony uh, on Adobe Connect. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Okay. Um, our goal at School District 54 is to increase our grad rates for Aboriginal students. What advice would you give to help us with this? And what do you see are the major reasons why Aboriginal students don't graduate? Hi, Tony. I actually know Tony personally. Oh, <laughs> amazing, amazing. <laughs> when I was thinking School District 54, that's who there is. Um, Oh, this is a big, a big question for me um, because I'm also researching it at an undergraduate and potentially graduate level. And for me, I think sports is huge. And uh, I say sports because, um, you know, after school when you don't have anything to go do, kids will steal. Kids will go do B and E's to cars that have nothing in them. They will smoke pot. They will do nothing because they're bored at home and their parents and some for some families they don't have that infrastructure and uh, it's it's funny that Tony's actually asking this question because Tony's one of the parents when I grew up when I was a little girl that I would hang out with her son he's one of my best friends and that was my something that was my something to do after school was for us to like play sports and video games and to to recognize that a lot of Aboriginal students need that that extra support that extra programming because they don't have that option of going home and hanging out with their parents and asking them how their day was or for their parents to be interested or just they have their own issues going on that they can't even deal with it. Um, and so for me, I, I definitely recommend after school programming and social programming, but also a mentorship program. I think it's a beautiful concept. I think it's so amazing and it doesn't even have to be an Aboriginal mentor. Just the idea that you have a mentor, because um, I can pinpoint like 10 mentors that I've had in the journey of all this loss and grief. And I think mentorship in sports is a beautiful combination and it's such a nice integration um, to have more success. And the extra tutoring programs and for teachers to understand that you could put these programs in place and you could put these mentorship programs in place, but the problem is the genuineness behind that. And it takes work, it takes work of the community and to, if there's going to be mentors and, and programs after school, is that the people running them and the mentors that are chosen, like they genuinely have to care. They have to care that I, I really want to help this student, I really want to help them, whether they're Aboriginal or not, because that's again, the feeling of I'm loved, I matter, I care, I'm cared for, I can do this, and, and that's where I think you'll see a lot of change and you'll see a lot of growth in Aboriginal communities. And I know that it is difficult in Smithers, but also cultural programming is really cool. Um, there's a lot going on with the Friendship Center where kids who are labeled, you know, at risk right now are doing drum making and, um, it's such a natural component to mental wellness as well as cultural wellness is to, I think it would be awesome to have a once a week 
um, after school programming where the kids really take on mentorship because I know the community Smithers very well and I know that uh, just like I do in Prince Rupert and here in Vancouver is that there's a lot of respect to learning culture and, and sometimes you know the initiation of that will have to be potentially be Aboriginal dominated to help run it and outsource the program at first but I think as the program grows and you invite more people in it'll be amazing it would be it would really change Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal leaders to like run programs like these would be really great. So our young ladies in the room, what do you think? What do you think helped you through high school? What helped you be successful in high school? Sports. 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 Because we have one, you know, we have Elisa speaking from the north, and then we have Jessica from the interior. We have Amy from the island, so it's a diverse group in here of, of youth from different locations in the province, right, and different stories, and personally knowing, you know, your um, families that um, sports and Amy, do you have any, what do you think helped you in high school? Programs at the French Center. I sit on offer a ton of things like they are running a eight week program for like moccasin making and drum making and all that kind of stuff that you can do with like deer hide because they went hunting and they're going to go fishing. I'm actually missing some of it right now because I'm here. <laughs> So, so, so tying back the cultural pieces yeah. then, in addition yeah. to, to the sports, that, that's interesting. Which kind of, sorry, which kind of okay. brought me to another light about programming um, and just some of the stuff that, you know, some of your Aboriginal students may deal with that you might not be able to recognize is the right revitalization of culture. And that here, I, I kind of challenge some program norms because a lot of people think that Aboriginal culture is about dancing and singing and medicine wheel and smudging. And that's a lot of the feel that I'm getting here in Vancouver, and I'm talking a lot about it with some Aboriginal students, and you know, not just over like casual talk, but like in-depth talk. Like I, I know an Aboriginal student, some older mates. One of them is an HKIN student. One is a, is a not a potential, a future 2014 graduate, first ever Aboriginal solder student. A what? Solder. Solders. Solders of business at UBC. He'll be the first one in 2014. Wow. And. Uh, we were talking about this and we are like, Aboriginal students need cultural programming that are cultural to their culture. Just like as if someone was Vietnamese or French or Filipino or anything, Spanish, they're each distinct in their own way. And so I grew up here now in Vancouver and I'm just figuring it out and I'm thinking, I've been surrounded by medicine wheel teachings and the four sacred teachings of medicine that I'm like, is this a part of my culture? Like, I don't know. So I called my grandma and I told her, I was like, so proud that I'm learning all of this. And my grandma's like, it's not in our culture to smudge, Elisa. Do you know that? And I was like, no. <laughs> like, 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 you know, and that's just the reality because different Aboriginal people are like learning. And but to elaborate that on, it's also being incorporated and indoctrined in a lot of Aboriginal practices because it's being so socially pressured on non-Aboriginal people because that's what they think and so to run these programs or to do things or even Aboriginal students yourself it's okay to not know what your culture is it's okay to to incorporate other components of other cultures whether it be prairie or west coast or as long as it's it makes you feel good as long as it is making you feel that this is what I feel like culture is to me because no one can take that away from you yeah. I've actually got a comment here from somebody online who okay. um, calls herself G at FNTC. And she says, I used to have a youth when I ran a youth program here in Vancouver. I guess she's referring to mentorship. Okay. Just going back a few minutes there. Okay. Um, she told me that she'd volunteer for as many things as possible so that she didn't have time to party with friends. The busier she keeps herself, the less she would use the time to casually socialize. Her social time was with other active youth volunteering together. 
I'm thinking about that and I'm I'm smiling about that and not smiling at the same time because I I think about that this is totally true this is so sound that I I do things because I when I moved here a lot of my friends that moved here uh, jumped into modeling and jumped into and still model and that's awesome that's great if that's your you know and and do the whole club promoting thing and do all these crazy things that are readily available to you in Vancouver that as I went through my transplant I recognized I can go out and I can party and you know have fun and and not drink and do all that but I also need to fill other stuff that I want to do and I realized that as I grew partying and stuff like that wasn't really wasn't wasn't what I was really into and so I, I did volunteer a lot and you do meet amazing people if you volunteer and you'll be surprised the more you volunteer and the more that you jump into different organizations that you meet amazing people and it's positive people because everyone who volunteers they're finding something they want to do they want to make a change and I definitely recommend it totally and even if your community doesn't have a great you know, a great support system in terms of volunteering at the Friendship Center or something. There's so many things. You can volunteer at a local animal shelter. You can volunteer at a thrift store. You can, you know what I mean? There's ways to incorporate volunteering that can, that can be positive for you. And I think it's so, I think it's so amazing. It's so good. But, sir. Did, did we have a second part to that question? Did we answer the second part? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. If there so it was more of a part. comment, not so much a question. Oh, well, okay. not that question, but the previous question. Oh, sorry, Tony's, Tony's question. There yeah, was two parts to his question. Her part. Her, her, her question. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Tony. <laughs> it's okay. Let me just scroll back up here. Yeah, no worries. It was... Um, okay, so again, I'll just read the whole thing again. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. So our goal at School District 54 is to increase our graduates for Aboriginal students. What advice would you give us to help us with this? So increasing the graduation yeah, rates. And, and then the second part was, what do you see as the major reasons why Aboriginal students don't graduate? It's a difficult one. That's a tough one. It, because it's personal. It's me. It's like, it's youth that I work with. And for me, I I didn't want to grad. For me, I can give my story then maybe elaborate on that. For me, but I was I didn't want to not graduate because I was scared. I didn't want it to be another statistic. I didn't want it to be an embarrassment on one side of my family. And there's a lot of you know personal in-depth issues, but for I think for some students when they don't graduate is they just like, they don't see the point. They don't see the end goal. They don't see, it's just a lot of it is emotional baggage that's going on at home and the inability to, to cope with it. And, uh, to work around that, to solve that, it is going to take more than just adding programs. It's going to take more than doing that. It's again to care and and ways to change it. And, and the rates from up north, and the reason why I don't think that they're as high, unfortunately, as as they should be, is because as the dysfunction continues in Aboriginal communities, and as these youth go to school and graduate with each other, sorry, not graduate. Um, is that they're feeding off of each other because they have nothing else to feed off of. They have only what is being taught and what's happening in their communities and feeling lost and feeling lost social identity, lost cultural identity. And I think that's one of the key factors why they're not graduating at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that the effects? That, I mean, a lot of them are second or third generations mm -hmm. removed from the parents or the grandparents who went to residential school, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and I think there's a combination of factors playing, you know, that play for the success rate. I look back on my own experience, and there is a um, First Nations professor with Thompson River University who did a survey, and he followed up with me probably about 10 years ago, and he told me about um, he was working on a thesis and his. his and it was on, he, he had monitored me and the group I began with um, in high school from grade eight to 10. And this is going back 25 years. So I mean, that's how long ago I was you know, in high school. So anyhow, he monitored a group of us. And so when I think back to that point in time, um, grade eight to 10, there was about 30 First Nations students in the local high school. So by the time, 
I had graduated, I had um, I caught up to two students that were in grades above me. I think one was in grade two grades above me and one was in a grade above me. So by the time I had graduated, um, there was three graduates that year as opposed to 30. So what, what's the percentage? 10%? 10%? 10%? Less than 10%. 3%? 3%? Anyhow, somebody got a number for me? <laughs> Sitting in the class, what percentage that is? 3 out of 30. And that's 10%. Um, 10%. Right. 10%. Yeah. So, so, his, so when he had called me up, he had tracked me down and said, um, I'm, I'm completing this paperwork. I'm just wondering if I can use your name and your contacts because I actually want to include you in on a report. And I said, well, tell me what it is first. And then he told me the background of how he was tying in into his, his, his paper the, the social problems. You know, the alcoholism, the, the status, the, um, the parenting, uh, just all the uh, social determinants of health. You know, the housing, like Elisa had talked about, not having a house and being kicked out at a very young age. I mean, for me, that, that was, would be hard to comprehend, but it's the reality of what happens in First Nations communities. So I guess I, I agree with Elisa. It's hard to pinpoint just one area that is a barrier for increasing graduation rates. Every person is probably different. I mean, I had a strong family support and my mom threatening me. She threatened me in grade 10 and told me, you're going to graduate in two years and I'm going to walk you to every single classroom. If I see another D on your report card, I'm going to walk you to every single classroom. And I thought, oh, my mom would just totally do that. She would grab me by the elbow and walk me to every class. And I, it's not something I wanted, but it's, it's the, that social family background and support that I had that, that I attribute to this day that, that, you know, where my success was in high school. So every case is actually different. It's hard to pinpoint one area of, yeah. Um, yeah. And you just, it, it kind of is a, a nice transition and uh, to what I was thinking, actually mm -hmm. I was thinking of me growing up in Smithers as you were telling that story and specific parents or specific teachers that really pulled, pulled, pulled at me. And the idea is that it, it really, it, it can take one teacher, it can take one friend, it can take, um, and how I actually stopped smoking pot, because I started really young. I'm not, young. I'm not, I'm not going to sit yeah. here and lie to anyone. I started in yeah, grade four. Grade four to grade, to grade seven. And that's the boundaries, but not having yeah, the social acceptance at exactly. home. Yeah, and it was like I wanted to fit in with my sister. I wanted to do what she was doing, and she was 18. And I was like, I want to feel loved. I want to spend time with my sister. And that was the only way that I could spend time with my sister. And... Um, Stemming from that, how it all stopped. It, it, you know, it was one person. It was, it was my best friend, um, who is more like a brother to me now. Uh, and him and another fellow, you know, it was during a baseball tournament. It was like we were like 12, 13. Like baseball was huge, and like it's huge in Smithers, and it's huge in Prince Rupert. And they said it to me, I came so high, and I was playing back catcher, and they're like, "What are you doing? Like this is our semifinals." Like, and they're like. It's either us or the pot. And at that moment, I was so scared. I was so scared to lose the one thing that was stable. And for anyone that could be, that could be school, that could be, that could be relationships with your cousins or your family. But for me, that was them. They were my stabi stability along with their families at that time. And I was like, oh my God. And from that day, I've never smoked pot. Literally from that day, ever. And. Uh, and you know it, it can take one person, and, and for school being in Smithers, it took one teacher, two, maybe two. I'm gonna say two. It took two teachers for me to really figure out what I was doing, and um, one of them was an elementary school teacher, and I was in grade six, and he just like encouraged me all the time to play sports. And another uh, teacher, a female teacher actually from school district 54. Her name is Miss Lytle and really guided me through the, tr the transitions of like what was going on, but it took that extra step. It doesn't, you know, 
to help a student is difficult, to help a student that's dealing with socioeconomic and racism and all of that, it's going to take a little more than a, a band-aid fix solution and that's just, you know, but the message that there, it can be only one person, it can be uh, to really support a student to, to increase those graduation rates. So. So I guess turning it back on maybe some of the classrooms involved, what do you see as students, you know, as a positive support in your system and your staying in school? Um, it would be nice to be able to, to hear a couple comments about, you know, what helps you and what do you recognize as your support system that helps you stay in school? Yeah, sure. we'll, give you, we'll give you a few minutes. <laughs> and we'll just sing a song while you're kind sure. of chatting. Sure. Take it away, Crystal. Way, oh, way, oh, way, oh, way, oh. Okay, there's, there's has to be some feedback now. <laughs> I'm just thinking. I'm thinking about work. I'm thinking about school. <laughs> yes, your mind is racing. Well, I so, have a comment or kind of a question. Yeah. Um, Can you speak up just a little bit? Okay. Your story is pretty amazing. <laughs> you've been through, to me, I feel like you've been through a lifetime of somebody who's like 50. Um, and I think of like all of, I'll call them like black, black cloud moments where you've had like a loss and death. Um, and you have really, really good energy. So, has it always been like that, or has there been a shift somewhere where you were like mad or upset or angry, where to a point now where even in a bad situation you make it good? Because to me, there's no point in being negative or angry that my thought is, is that you should be grateful. And I always try and start my day with something that I'm grateful for and at the end of the night. and. I'm wondering if at some point in your, you, to me, you're still, I look at you and you're a baby. I know, I get <laughs> crystal too, I get that. <laughs> so has there been at some point where you were like dealing with all of that black cloud stuff and then realized that you had to make that shift to just, even if it's a bad situation, you have to find the good? It's interesting, it's interesting that you say that because someone just asked me this yesterday. And because uh, we were thinking, uh, we have a discussion panel. Uh, I also sit on the Aboriginal Steering Committee. <laughs> it's a, it's a province-wide uh, committee with all universities encompassing. And uh, I was talking about it, I was trying to think, and I, I really don't know when that moment was. I know it was when I was, uh, it was when I, I transitioned to, or sorry, it was, it was the moment that I saw, sorry, I was like thinking of my thoughts, it was the moment when I saw my father's body in his casket. It is the most unreal and surreal thing to, to experience a loss, to experience someone in your family, but to experience at 15 to look at someone in a casket and it being your father, and you know, not being able to celebrate Father's Day or my sweet 16 or graduation and all these amazing things that you go through in your life. And it was like, my dad would not want me to it was that if it was my dad, if it was my grandmother, like none of your family members genuinely, no one wants you to be unhappy. No one wants you to experience that. And so I, I really thought about it. And it was more of, you know, it was more of a fake for the first year of pretending to be happy, pretending to be optimistic, because that was my coping mechanism. I was like, I'm going to fake my way to happiness. Like, <laughs> this, this, this is how it's going to happen. And, um, Eventually, it was it was my younger siblings. I have ten, and <laughs> wow. through adoption, through oh, my yeah. native side, okay. through my Vietnamese okay. side, yeah. like there's there's a bit of um, and it was like recognizing that when you know when my father passed away, I was carrying him in my arms, and he was only I think he was 16 months at the time, or like 12 months or so. No, it have to be smaller than that. I want to say 10 months. He was like 10 months years old, and I was like. I have to be the change for them. I have to. And it took a lot of like personal tr strength. It took a lot of, a lot of nights thinking about this. And you know, at first it was being angry. I was like, I'm 15. I experienced every type of loss and failure. And 
I was like, I want to be like my normal friends who can go home and, you know, just relax on the couch and like have dinner made for them and laundry done. How amazing would that be in my mind? Um, but it was, it was after my father passed away. Like it was a really like eye opener that like I had to, I had to do something. I had to change it. And if I wanted to be happy, I had to do, I had to do something about it. And it was, it's not easy. It's definitely not. And I am human. I am real. I don't sparkle. I have my bad days. I really do, and you know what? And it's it's keeping your end goal and my end goal in in perspective. And that my end goal is I want to get my master's in public and social policy. I want to look at social programming and government policies and how they how it really fits, how it really works. Not to just have it on paper, not to have something written on paper. And I want it to actually be sustainable and feasible and it work and not, you know, not just take and not just to have government money thrown into programs that don't work because there wasn't proper consideration, there wasn't um, items put into play. Mm -hmm. You are a warrior. <laughs> you are a warrior. Do we have any comments from the classroom? Oh, really? You have that elaborate story. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I guess what I'm looking at is. Mm -hmm. um, the choice of career, if we can now jump to yeah, where you sure. are today, yeah. and the choice of career, so talking a bit, so because you're, you're SFU, and I, I actually met one of your mentors last night um, from Langara. Oh, Larry. Larry. Larry, he was Larry, like Larry I was at the career fair, and... Oh, he's on this right now, is he not? I don't uh, know. He is actually up at the First Nations Education Steering Committee oh. conference okay. here being hosted. But um, in the support systems and what you looked at, because that's a scary thing. That's the reality of moving to Vancouver. I mean, I'm a grown adult moving to Vancouver, yeah. let alone somebody young or a student <laughs> moving here for the first time, yeah. right? You know, coming yeah. to a university or college in the in the surrounding area. So let's talk a bit about the career choice and the, the oh. supports you found here in the city. It's an embarrassing story, actually. And you uh -oh. know, it's... it's um, I call my brother now. Uh, his name's Travis. Uh, he's, you know, one of my best friends growing up, and uh, he was really into policing. And I only went to Langara to play badminton. And in my mind, this is really embarrassing to mention. I was like, I wait, I have to go to school if I want to play badminton for you? Like, I was like, this is ridiculous. I was like, I'm thinking I could just like go and play badminton and go in the provincials, and it would be all fine and dandy. And so. They were like, you have to pick a program, and I was talking with my brother, and I was like, I have to pick a program. Like I was thinking in my mind, I was like, what program? So I'm looking at the program, like women's studies, like no, like geography, no. I was like, sciences, no. And I was like looking, and you know, he wanted to become an R. He is going to become an RCMP, and I was like, criminology. Just follow what my brother's doing. <laughs> it was funny because I took components out that, and you, you really, I feel like you. I picked that program because I thought it was my brother, but it's also deeper than that. It's having contact. I had to have had something that drove me into that, into that direction, and for me, it was change. And it, I haven't had any, you know, experience with the justice system at all. But I have had an experience with a police officer that used to live in Smithers. His name was Mike Cook, and his wife was Amy Cook, and they were neighbors to me. And they were also my something to do after school when I was locked out of my house like three times a week and I would just like wander over to their house and like they left a key there to, for me to get in their gate and I would like sit outside their house for an hour after school and like play with their dog and they'd invite me in and I'd have dinner with them so that was that that's the beauty and that's what I want in in you know changes and I chose I chose it and I ended up loving it I ended up falling in love with school and I never thought I would say this I never thought in a million years I would say I love going to class and I love school because trust me, this was not the case when I was in Smithers or Prince Rupert. And uh, so from there I finished Langara for two years and Larry was really encouraging me and he was like, hey, it's, as much as we love you and as much as you know, you're our little young one here, we need to kick you out. Like you need to go to university, <laughs> you need to like go, go, go to your degree. And I was like, oh man. And uh, so I, I strive, I strive for 
uh, to get into the criminology program and I will be accepted. I'm conditional acceptance right now because I'm missing statistics. So. <laughs> That's what you're taking. <laughs> um, and so it's been an interesting journey because the group at Langara, oh, I can't even explain. Like, I could probably cry about this beauty of students that are there. I have a good close of five students. And the beauty of being, of having Aboriginal spaces and that support, because that support at school will always be there for you um, when you come here. And it, because there's a lot of difficult stuff that happens outside of it, is that you don't need to explain any of the pre stuff. You don't need to talk about residential school. You don't need to talk about culture. You don't need to talk about racism. Like every angry thing that you feel um, or anything that happened, you're like, you get it. Let's move on. We can talk about like making sarcasm about it. You can talk about actual life, like actual school. And that was the beauty of Lake Air College. And that was the beauty of the Aboriginal gathering space that they had there was to have that. And it's the one place that you can go to vent on campus. And by vent, I mean vent. Like there was days, like for example, when I walked in to talk to them about needing a transplant, I literally nonchalant walked in and looked at the first person I told actually was my donor, my future donor. And I was like, 80, I'm dying. And at first she was like, don't worry, like, semester's almost over, like, it's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be okay, Lisa. Like, you're a little dramatic sometimes. Like, don't worry, it'll be okay. And I'm thinking, no, like, I'm, I'm actually dying. Like, my kidneys are dying. And like, everyone in the Langara room, no one treated me as if I was different. Um, no one was like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, everyone remained in the room and just kind of looked at me with, like, compassion and were super, like, just listening to me. Because I, it didn't hit me, but 20 minutes, or, like, 20 minutes after talking, and as soon as my donor, like, we didn't know she was going to be my donor at the time, like, hugged me, boom, tears in my eyes, trickling, and I was like, I'm dying! And I was being, like, so dramatic about it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big thing. <laughs> it's a big thing. It is a big thing. And so at the time, you know, they... They, uh, they made jokes about me being sensitive, and I'm like, okay, I can take that. I'm very sensitive, but, you know, jumping to SFU, I hit the same experience as if I was moving from a small town to Vancouver, because when I jumped to SFU, I hated it. And there's many professors at SFU and, and many people there that know that I, I hated it. I hated my first year, because not only was I dealing with a transplant, going to Langara and SFU at the same time, going to the hospital 12 hours a week, as well as, you know, my ex-boyfriend, um, he chose a different path. Unfortunately, he cheated on me after my transplant, about a week after my, my transplant. And, and I was like, what is going on with my life? And so I was like, I'm going to go to the native room. I was like, of course it'll make me feel better. But the idea is that when Aboriginal students make that transfer, some of them, even at SFU, like, don't really recognize they haven't had previous experience. And a lot of the students that jump from college to university are at a different place in their life, and that's what I'm finding. I'm still like one of the youngest students at, like, at SFU as, as I, I was at Langara, and it's, um, it's taken some time, but we've finally started to build a community there, and it's been a, a really difficult process. I don't know how many times for the first time in my life I wanted to quit something. And for the first time ever last year after my transplant, up until a couple of weeks ago, I was like, I'm done. I quit, like, blah, 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 like, I'm over this. And you know what? Then, like, scholarships started pouring in. And, like, letters about how, like, amazing I am poured in. And I, like, am so appreciative of, like, all the scholarships because for me it wasn't about the money, even though I definitely suffered financially. <laughs> the year after my, or the months and days following after my transplant, it was that they saw something in me that I was missing or lacking, and so that it was, I can do this, I can figure this out, and it's been interesting, and so the support at SFU and at school, I recognize that they're there, but you have to make it, and you have to own it, you have to make it your own, and to create these programs, and you can make things happen, students, and even students in high school don't believe things can happen. I can give you an example. So not to give you the whole history of it, but unfortunately, uh, the money allocated to make an Aboriginal space at SFU was misallocated. And that happened. Is it right? No. But, you know, that's political issues that I definitely don't want to mention here. I, I want to talk about the positive light of that, and that's the fact that students 
you know, wrote a letter to the president and explained the situation. Oh, okay, so we, you know, we've worked in in circle discussion about that, and um, and we're finally going to be creating an Aboriginal space, but really owning it as if it as if it's ours. It is ours. It will belong to us. It it's a good place to meet new students to to find your culture. You never know who is also Haida or you know, Heisla right. or something. Right. Like you never know. If you want to learn about your culture, it's the best place to go. It really is. And uh, you can make things happen out of this Aboriginal space. Like our organization, uh, we paid for drum making. We've paid for all these amazing things. But it's it's the students who make it happen. That's right. It's as if the students in high school. You can make it happen if you want to learn how to make a drum. If you want to do moccasins. If you want an elder to come into your class talk to the Aboriginal support network like these things can happen it's just it takes one student and and for me it's taken two students at SFU for us to be like okay let's do this <laughs> she's a go-getter <laughs> no, yeah. I am human though I swear I I, I've been hearing that all week actually you're the third person to say that to me <laughs> So, I mean, Elisa's, she, her energy is always like this, you know, she yeah, probably even on her, her worst day. Actually, um, how I met Elisa was I was actually holding down for my own personal, you know, drop in basketball, and Elisa's on the other end, probably looking at the call display, yeah. saying, where are you calling from? Where are you calling from? And I'm like, I'm calling on my own because I want to come to drop in basketball. But where are you calling from? Which business are you associated with? Because I recognize the St. Paul's number. Yes, and <laughs> she was so full of energy. I just had to give her the lowdown on where I was calling from. And, and then, what do you do there? <laughs> and then after that, oh, a good. great relationship was built. So now we have this reciprocal uh, relationship. And this is how she is. And she's full of energy, full of life. Um, wonderful. And... Um, we're, we're coming to an end. Um, is there any comments from any of the classrooms? And um, in addition to that, you're 22 turning 23. No, you're 20. I, this is, this is my last day of being 20. I'll be 21 tomorrow. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and everyone in the room is blowing their mouth so. She is 20 turning 21. So actually she's uh, 20 days and 300 or 20 years old and 364 days. Yeah. So I think we should close this. We're in here and we're going to sing her happy birthday. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy so birthday to Lisa. Happy birthday to you. Um, you know the time that you've taken to participate in our um, youth circle today um, it does mean a lot and it does mean a lot the good work that you're doing overall for for the youth in the province because you, you are doing you sit on some very <laughs> some very provincial province-wide um, committees for youth Aboriginal youth in addition to uh, the committees at and yeah, I know you're involved with the oh, Urban yeah. Native Youth Association <laughs> in downtown Vancouver, all the work that you're doing at the Friendship Center, the work that you're doing for students at SFU, and that's only to name a few, which is a lot of the provincial work that she's doing. So I really appreciate the stu you sharing your story because I think it's important and valuable for other youth to hear it coming from youth that you know the message you uh, gave today about keeping that goal you know, in your mind, knowing that you want something mm -hmm. and asking for the help and that there are resources out there. It's just, it's finding those resources and being comfortable for asking. So do you have any closing remarks? Hmm. How to sum this all up. Um, I always like to keep it in perspective of uh, your, your mind, your mind and your body and listening to your body and listening to to your mind in the sense that if you know something's not right, make a change, do something about it. If you feel instinctively this is wrong or you're so unhappy and that you're in a place that is dark and it's not fulfilling you, make a change and ask for help and everything is possible. I, you know, I didn't ask for help with my transplant. My friends just kind of jumped on board. 
But having said that, the help that followed that, I, for the first time, needed to ask for help in my life, and it was so difficult. I, and uh, to do it, like honestly, if I can go from dropping out of school for most parents really thinking that I was gonna be the first girl to get pregnant, drop out of school, and having their kids not wanna hang out with me, to being almost at a graduate national level, like anything honestly is possible. Not to make this so cheesy, but it totally is. It's realistic, it's your mind, it's the opportunity, and you giving yourself that opportunity with your mind. There's just a couple of closing comments here. <laughs> uh, what, one's from Sandra. Thanks for setting this up. And thanks to Elisa. That was great. Happy birthday. <laughs> and then Tony <laughs> says, thank you so much. This was great. So proud of you, Elisa. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. And maybe just uh, we can mention what's coming up. Yes, I was actually just going to mention. Big twilight. Thank you. We do have um, a couple of presentations coming up in the near future. Can you help me out here, Catherine, on, twen on the tw 27th or 29th? I'm sorry, I didn't grab my book. We do, on, we do have a, a website, the, what is it, uh, the Learning Circle, the links we've been sending out to all of your instructors. We do have William Bellew coming to our circle by the end of the month. And um, his lead in role it, um, was, um, he was one of those historical wolves um, from Twilight in the original movie. So he'll be coming to the circle next Thursday. Next Thursday. So don't miss out on him. He has a fabulous uh, story to share as well and where he's at today. And he actually comes uh, to us from es Eskadam, which is Alkali Lake up in the north. And after that, December 12th, December 12th, we have Trevor Mack, who is doing his uh, Bachelor of, I believe he's in media over at um, University of Catalano. And in addition, oh, and he's the Ice Games winner. He's our um, First Nations Ice Game Canada winner. And he'll be competing in California, I believe it's um, by the end of winter 2013, so in the next four to five months. So he's training hard, and he was actually, his sponsor is um, Red Bull, I believe, one of his sponsors. Are those our next two sessions? And then there's one more, uh, Aboriginal e-mentoring, December 6th. Oh, right, when we talk about mentoring, Elisa talked about mentoring. We're looking, we have a program um, in one of the other departments here at UBC um, to help um, high school students um, stay in the health sciences, uh, the um, science, biology, um, what's the other one with the, the chem tables? Human chem chemistry. Chem uh, uh, chemistry, to stay in those um, academic courses through high school. So it's an online mentoring where you have a t you're have you attached to a tutor in your area and it's all computer based. So that is on the 20... December 6th. December 2nd. 6th. Six. 6th, Six, sorry. <laughs> Check our website. Just keep, just stay, <laughs> stay linked in by our website. And I, I thank you for all your patience and participation. Have thank a good you. day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Are we off?